Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Just, just reflect for a moment on how God trained Israel. Just pause for a moment and reflect about how God chose to train Israel. Reflect for a moment on the land to which he is bringing them. Those years in the wilderness, that wasn't a party, right? That was hard work, and it was discipline, and it was difficult. That's why. They gave in to whining and complaining. It's because it was hard. The land where he's bringing them to, what prospect are they facing? War and enemies and temptations. And now wait a second, God. Why didn't you put them on a tropical island with no inhabitants and food growing from trees and just falling into their mouths? Why, why didn't you do that? I think it says something about how he intends to train his people. And he usually intends to train his people through difficult times. It's not easy. It's going to be hard. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of this in Hebrews chapter 12. After the exhortation to lay aside sin and in light of the cloud of witnesses, he reminds us in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3, Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. The assumption is that people are prone to grow weary and lose heart. You're not alone. That's the assumption. And so he turns us to Christ and says, Consider Christ. He really endured some sin. In fact, he resisted to the point of shedding his blood, which leads me to say things like, oh, that paper was hard? Show me the blood. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there is a sense in which our tolerance for pain and difficulty when it comes to this kind of work is a little low, and the exhortation of Hebrews is a good one. Don't forget Consider him who endured hostility. You've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Verse 7, it's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. Now listen, you're going to leave this school and you're going to go out and get a job somewhere. Hopefully. <laughs> Be gainfully employed. And your employer is going to want the kind of people who work hard and do things above and beyond the call. He's not going to teach you everything you need to learn on the job. He's going to expect that you'll go home, check a few books out of the library, and show up to work next week and say, I learned this all by myself. That's the kind of employee he wants. More importantly, those are the kind of people we need in church who go home and read and come prepared, either to share at the Lord's Supper or to participate in a women's Bible study or to pray at a prayer meeting, or to lead a discussion group. We need the kind of people who say, this is going to be hard. Click, the TV goes off. Sorry, can't chit-chat with you. This is something that has to be done because it's important. And what we're doing in this class is designed to turn you into those kind of people. Chapter 5 of the book of Deuteronomy. We're not going to cover the whole chapter today. In fact, this is another introduction to the next main section of the book. We've finished with the historical section. Now we move into what section? I hear it. The stipulation section. Okay. Most scholars will break the stipulation section, this big section of legal material, down into two broad categories. And you should recognize these categories are the general stipulations and specific stipulations.
As the name suggests, this first category are broad principles, and the second category are more detailed legal material. The first category breaks down 5, 1 through 11, 32, and the second one breaks down 12, 1 through 26. Um, I'll say 19. You'll find variation at the end of that section. Two broad sections in this stipulation, this major block of stipulations. The general stipulations are foundational principles. These are foundational principles of the whole covenant. They define the basic attitudes that ought to be part of the vassal who is committing himself to obey his suzerain. They address issues like who the suzerain is, what he has done for the vassal, what he will do for the vassal in the future, how he expects his vassal to respond. It's broad general principles. You're not going to find in this section the details of what to do in every situation. It's the big picture that's going to then guide the attitudes and obedience that will play themselves out in the specific stipulation section. So broad, notice this one is much larger, larger section. These are the generals. The specific stipulations detail more precisely how the basic principles of the covenant work out in daily life. So we start big picture, and then it's going to work down into individual situations working themselves out through these principles in daily life. This is the application section. Oftentimes when preachers are commended, it's because, wow, that preaching was very practical, very applicational. He helped us see how to do this in real life. God's sort of doing the same thing with Israel. He gives them these broad principles and then works through how those principles play themselves out in daily living. This is where the rubber meets the road or how the general principles trickle down into daily life. It's important. It's important to recognize the distinction. The distinction actually works itself out in the actual language of the book. The kind of laws we find in the general stipulation section are described as apodictic. Let me, give you, let me teach you this term. That's a term you want to know. Apodictic, while the laws in the specific stipulation section are described as casuistic. The difference between the two illustrates the difference between the general stipulation section and the specific stipulation section. This first group of laws, the apodictic section, these are the kind of laws that are presented in the do not do this form. Do not this and do not that. In Hebrew, we're looking at lo plus an imperfect verb. And we often see these paraphrased. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. Do not murder. They are cut and dry. You just never do these things, ever. The Ten Commandments are a good example of apodictic laws. The casuistic laws are case laws. They are used, presented in situations where if this happens, then you must do this. If this happens, then you should do that. These are presented with a protasis, that is a, an introductory phrase, followed by an apodosis. That is the concluding phrase. If, this is your if phrase, if this happens, then you must do this. So it's, it's the difference between a general principle that says never ever murder and a rule that says if you find that somebody committed a murder and they did it unintentionally, here's what should happen. If instead you find somebody committed a murder and they did it on purpose, you do that instead. The general rule is never murder. And then it works itself out 
in these different cases, depending on what happens. And you'll, you've read some of that in the book of Deuteronomy. Sometimes a murder happens unintentionally, right? You're out there swinging your axe, and whoops, oh, there goes Joe. Rats. And what's supposed to happen? Well, listen, this is a serious deal. Joe's dead. Joe had a wife and three kids, and the elders want to know what, what happened here. And so they come, and they investigate, and they say, did you ever have any problems with Joe? And everybody says, no, he and Joe were good buds. There, it, was a, it was a total mistake. Okay, fine. Joe's family, you don't, don't come after this guy. He didn't do it on purpose. And if they won't relent, then Joe can flee to one of the cities of refuge. On the other hand, if you find out, yeah, Joe owed him some money. And in the last year of Jubilee, Joe didn't pay it back. And he wanted another loan. And that axe probably flew on purpose. Okay, in that case, different situation, different penalty, different rules. We move to a different case law to deal with that difficult situation. There's a modern example of this. Maybe you could think of the marriage vows that people swear as an example of the difference between a general stipulation and a specific stipulation or apodictic laws and casuistic laws. Think about the wedding vow. Think about how vague it actually is, right? When you get married, when I married my wife, I promised, right, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer, very traditional, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and cherish, we added as Christ loved the church, till death do us part, and on and on. Notice how, how broad and general that is. You stand up there and you promise your whole life. It never says anything about what happens in daily life. I vow to do the dishes every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. I vow to always take out the trash. I vow that if I see dirty dishes on the kitchen table, I will take... I knew the honeymoon was over when I started leaving dishes on the counter, and my wife says to me one day, you know, those don't fly into the dishwasher by themselves. And I said, really? Watch this. I'll leave it here, and tomorrow it'll be in the dishwasher. <laughs> and every so often, I tell my kids, you want to see a magic trick? Watch this. If you leave that there tomorrow, it'll be in the dishwasher. <laughs> the point is, yes, Liz? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that I vowed, and husbands and wives vow broad general vows that don't really cover every single detail of life. And then general stipulations are that way. They don't cover every single detail. It's down in the specific stipulations. It's in the, the daily living out of this covenant that those general principles are expressed, right? To love and to cherish. Do you believe that me taking my dirty dishes and putting them in the dishwasher is actually a manifestation of loving and cherishing, right? Me picking up my socks and making sure they get in the, the laundry chute is a manifestation of loving and cherishing. Taking out the trash, making my, having her make, if she makes my meals for me, these are examples of loving and going to work and making sure that I do my job so that I get paid. That's an example of loving and cherishing. So think for a moment. It's not, when we come to these specific stipulations, you're going to be prone to say to yourselves, oh my word, this is, this is onerous and horrible. Another way to look at it is, no. Doing these things is actually a reflection of the fact that you're obeying these broad general stipulations and that your heart is prone to loving the Lord and obeying out of love rather than just rule keeping. Obeying the specific stipulations is a manifestation of your attitude and willingness to obey these broad general principles. I think if people actually vowed all the details of a married life on the altar, they might not get married. When I mean, you think about all the sacrifice you have to make, all the uh, self-denial, yes, 
mixed with all the opportunities to show love, but all that self-sacrifice is actually an example of that love at the same time. I heard a news report on NPR the other day. Uh, a woman had written a book about uh, letting men be men in a modern, secular woman, secular book in modern society, and she was trying to recover manhood for men in society in general. And the comment she made that sort of sparked my interest was, you know, I want to train my sons to be actualized as men and to be willing to talk about their feelings and be willing to understand women and at the same time be men and understand that, you know, you don't have to sacrifice yourself for anybody and you can't, you don't have to sacrifice to reach your dreams and even in your relationships, you don't have to give things up to, and I'm sitting there saying, well, wait a second. That seems to be the exact opposite of what Scripture teaches, right? Laying down your lives and using Christ as an example of husbands loving their wives is the example of self-sacrifice. But it's an example of something difficult and sacrificial done out of love, not out of rote obedience. Valentine's Day is coming up. People are going to spend millions on flowers. And I dare say not a single man will show up. Honey, I brought you these flowers because the marriage book said I should. Right? Why did you? They're so beautiful. I know. It was such a sacrifice. But I had to. Never. She'd throw him in his face, close the door, come back tomorrow, try again. That's not the attitude God wants. Instead, he would see, and the book would argue, that these, the obedience of these specific stipulations is actually the working out in the heart of the people, the love they have for God, their commitment to him, their desire to be faithful for him, as uh, argued, as commanded in the general stipulations. Merrill writes, you read it in your commentary, the general stipulations spelled out in broad strokes the kind of actions and reactions the great king expected from his vassal. And the other, that is the specific stipulations, offered examples of how these general expectations could and should be worked out in everyday life within that relationship. As we move into this specific stipulation section, both of these sections, notice in some ways how comprehensive God's instructions on life were. You've now read through the book twice. God gets pretty detailed about the things he wants Israel to think about. Clothing, how you sow seed in your field, how you treat your workers, how you treat your spouse, how you treat your children. It's pretty amazing how God just didn't leave these broad strokes. He gave the broad strokes, and then he shows how they work themselves down into daily life. The book of Deuteronomy the covenant itself, does not assume that this is something the people of Israel can assent to. They can say, yes, I will be a part of this, and then leave right there on the table. It's something they take with them into every facet of their lives. It affects how they make war. It affects how they make policy. It affects many, many aspects. It affects personal hygiene. It's amazing how specific these laws work themselves out into everyday life. We live in a day and age when the trend among uh, the democratic perception, democratic meaning dem democratic society, that perception of how religion should play itself out in public office is you may have some religion, but don't you bring it into office with you. In fact, your religion should be left out at the door and not brought with you into office. And sometimes I hear people say that, and I say, what does that mean? Oh, so Jesus tells me uh, to love my neighbor as myself. Is that the part you want me to leave out at the door? Jesus tells me to uh, not lust after the interns. Is that, is that the part you want me to leave at the door? Uh, Jesus tells me, the, the New Testament, and you can go through all, is that what you want me to leave at the door? No way, right? We are believers in Christ, and we bring that with us every single place we go. And guess what? The Israelites were supposed to be exactly the same. 
You can't just say, I'll sign up for the covenant and then leave it at the government reaffirmation ceremony. It goes with you when you go to war, when you go home, when you go to work, when you go to the gate, when you pay your servants, when you plow your field, when you get dressed. The general principles come with you in all those situations. God intended these principles to be lived out even in the mundane details of life. That's because the stipulations of the covenant are more than just rules. They are expressions of fidelity to the king. We have rules at Emmaus. Many, many students don't like them. They're designed and written because we love you and want to protect you from yourselves. And, you know, you make rash decisions and we want to guide and channel and focus and help you succeed. My guess is most students don't think to themselves, as I obey these rules on campus, I'm expressing fidelity to Emmaus or to Dean Glock or to President Daughters. When I wear the right clothes in class, when I, I'm not late for curfew, when I comply with the teacher's instructions, I am showing fidelity to, we rarely think of rules that way. You should think about biblical instruction, biblical teaching, biblical rules exactly that way. When God tells Israel, do these things, and they say, I will do them, they're agreeing with the king. These things are important. They are trusting him that what he says is right. They're expressing their fidelity, their faithfulness, their willingness to serve the great king. This also emphasizes, that is, this distinction between general laws, specific laws, the emphasis on this big legal material in general, emphasizes the fact that God is concerned about teaching Israel, not just controlling Israel. He could have just given general laws. Don't do this, don't do that, stop doing this, stop doing that. Instead, he first lays out the general principles that regulate the heart attitude that goes behind all these laws. And I think it demonstrates he's about more than just controlling behavior. He's actually trying to change the heart. This is another aspect that sometimes gets lost on students when they come to a school with rules. Yes, we need rules to control how we all live together in the dorm. Turn your music off. At night, come on, be considerate. Don't run up and down the hallways. But there are many other rules that are not just about controlling behavior on campus. We want to change the way you think. That's really what we want to do, in case that wasn't made clear to you. We want to change the way you think so that you stop thinking this way and start thinking this way instead. Start thinking differently about how you use your time. Start thinking differently about how you use your money. Start thinking differently about how you serve the Lord and the context in which you serve the Lord. Start thinking differently about your responsibilities as they relate to your fellow students or the Worldwide Church of God or to a local church. Change, change, change. Some of you have to change more than others, but we're not just about controlling you. That's silly. In four years you leave, and what? You do whatever you want. No, the goal is to change the way you think. God's trying to do the same thing for Israel. And these laws, if we can get it into our head, are more than just about controlling. They're about teaching. Torah, the word that's used for the first five books, means teaching or instruction. That implies that there are things to be learned, instructions to be learned. There are commands to be obeyed. There's guidance about how to live in specific situations. This is going to become the wisdom for the rest of Israel's history. Now, in many, many ways, all the later writers are looking back on this instruction. And this is the crown jewel of Israel's theology. Look at the way God showed us how to live. That puts these legal materials in a different light. Let me suggest to you that it shines a light of grace on this legal material. Because you can imagine somebody saying, okay, we've got this great God. And he's really powerful. Look at what happened at Mount Sinai. 
I remember the fire and the lightning. And in the desert, the wilderness, a lot of people died often. How should we live before this God as we move into the land? And if God didn't tell them, they'd be in trouble. And so God does tell them. And in that sense, it becomes, wow, hallelujah, you've told us what to do. Now we can go in and do what you want out of the right heart. You, as students, know how it feels to have an assignment where you don't know the expectations. Right? And if it's an easy teacher, it doesn't matter. If it's a more difficult teacher and you don't have a sense of, what's he looking for? I mean, you sleep the sleep of the obsessive which is you don't sleep, right? You just, it's, it's terrible. And when the teacher gives you a rubric and he lays out for you on the rubric, I want this, 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 and that, you, you latch onto that and say, okay. And then most students make a mistake. This is the mistake they make. So, if I just do this, I get an A, right? And they turn it into a contract. And that's not what teachers want. That's not what teachers want. What teachers want is, if I do this, this is going to teach me how to really be a student and study hard and do well, right? And then the teacher says, yes. In that sense, this is the starting point for new skills that manifest themselves in a lifetime of study. When you reflect on the fact that the specific stipulations can't cover every single aspect of life in general, as specific as they are, it becomes clear that God is actually giving these laws in an attempt to teach Israel principles that are going to work themselves out in the myriad situations of life. Think about that. If you have one little book, that can't cover every situation of life. You've only got, I mean, okay, so what happens if my neighbor does this, but you didn't tell me what do I do if he does this on that side? Right? If we find a body in the field and it was an accident, okay, you've told me what to do. What if two people were involved and for one of them it was an accident? He didn't know, but the other guy did it on, well, what happens? You know what? He can't cover every single situation that's ever going to come up in the life of an Israelite. So instead, through the general stipulations, and then in the specifics, we have a principalizing of the kind of things that God wants Israel to do and to be. And so that's the folly of Israel then saying, okay, let me get this right. If I just do these, everything's going to be okay, right? Well, no. Think about what happens at the book, in the book of Malachi. They're bringing offerings to the Lord. And they're doing it with an attitude that says, oh, okay, it's time now to bring more offerings to the Lord. Wow, this is so great. There's your offering. God says, I don't want that. That led itself into the giving of blind offerings and lame offerings, which were illegal. But then there's this other category of the stolen offering. Can you imagine that? Wow, yeah, it's time to bring an offering to the Lord. And I've got my prized goat right there. And Joe has a goat too. Hey, Joe, look over there. Take Joe's goat, bring it to the temple, sacrifice Joe's goat. There you go, Lord. I brought you a great goat. You stole that. How, how can they convince themselves that this is okay? Because it descends into legalistic rule keeping and not actual heart change. Liz? Did you say that other ancient Near East treaties had the general stipulations as well? In some cases they do, yes. They have general stipulations that are broad, and they're shorter, not always as long, and then they include uh, specific stipulations too. Because even in those, I mean, that, that other king is not just looking for the bare minimum, right? He wants you to cling to him because... Again, he can't anticipate every possible situation that's ever going to come up in that contract. So a general heart of loyalty to the suzerain is key. And in Deuteronomy, it's, it's longer. But yeah, that, that's the basic principle. And I'd say that's the basic principle that any time rules are given, right? I heard one on the news today. They were thinking in Iowa of 
shortening of uh, making the nighttime curfew for high school students with intermediate licenses 10 o'clock instead of where it is now, 1230, in an attempt to c cut down on teenage accidents and those kind of things. And I'm sitting there and saying, I know exactly what's going to happen. Those kids are going to stay out till 9.59 because their heart is really not about safety and being smart and, and keeping themselves and their friends alive. It's about how can I have as much fun as possible. Really, what the government's trying to do, which it can't do, is create a heart change situation where kids say, you know what? It's dark. Am I really, what am I really going to go out and do tonight but be dumb? You know what? I'll stay home and not be dumb. And sometimes you got to go out to the swim meet, and sometimes you got to go out to the, you know, after ballet party. But most of the time, I'm just going out being dumb. So I'm not going to do it. That's never going to happen because the government can't bring about hard change. But guess what? It's hard for God to bring about hard change the same way. And the record of Israel shows that they did not actually change their hearts to make obedience a matter of love and fidelity to God. Instead, it descended into rule-keeping. And God prophesied this, and he warned them about it in the end of the book, Deuteronomy chapter 28. One of the more scary verses in the book, and a book that reminds us that God intended these rules, these stipulations, both general and specific, as something positive for Israel, not something to ruin their fun in the new land. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. At the end of the curses section, we read, I'll begin in verse 45. Verse 45 so all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. They will become a sign and a wonder on you and on your descendants forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. That is an amazing verse. As we move into the stipulation section, it's important for you to see God's expectation was that Israel would keep these things out of joy and with a glad heart for all of the things that God had done for them. For all the wonderfully abundant things He'd given them in the land, for all the great deliverance He has delivered them with in the historical prologue, for all the enemies He's defeated, for the rain He's been giving them in the fertile fields and the wonderful children, and he says, obey these laws, and he expects them to do it with joy. Let me suggest to you that will only happen if their hearts are changed and they respond to the Lord in faithfulness and out of love. Otherwise, it will descend into rule keeping. Why are these things coming upon you? Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart. That tells us something. We Christians live in the New Testament era, a new dispensation, but God makes demands on our lives too. Love your enemies. Pray for those, in the old King James, who spitefully use you. Now listen, that's that's a Deuteronomic commandment, right? I mean, it's a word. We look at that and say, what? Pray for my enemies? Forgive. 70 times 7. Have you ever thought when Jesus says forgive 70 times 7? Even if that guy comes to you 70 times and, se and repents, that the guy's not actually repenting? Jesus uses this insanely large number because he's anticipating a situation where, okay, Joe, that happened last week, and the week before, and the week before, and you're tempted to say to yourself, what? Joe's never going to change. I'm going to stop forgiving him. This is not a case where Joe sins 10 times, and on the 11th time, he, he makes it, he stops. No, no, no. It seems that he's suggesting Joe's never going to change. Doesn't matter. Keep forgiving. That is hard. 
And we're prone to look at those commands and say, I forgive you, Joe. And tomorrow I'll forgive you too. Instead of, you know what, Joe? God forgives me every time I sin. And I'm actually not going to change until I get to heaven, really. I'm going to forgive you the same way. And it turns it into something totally different. So, general stipulations, specific stipulations, broad principles, how those principles work themselves out in life, but even still, not comprehensive. And therefore, illustrating that God is about heart change, and he's doing that by teaching general rules and general principles, understanding that these will now work themselves out through a people whose hearts are changed in everyday situations throughout the whole history, throughout the whole history of the nation. They descended into rule keeping. And that meant they were not evidencing a changed heart. They just wanted the blessings of obedience without the heart change that results in true obedience that pleases the Lord. 